Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our panel here. Um, we are talking about governance challenges in the digital age, you know, finding new tools for policy making. I want to thank the room for coming. I know it's just after lunch, so we might be a little bit slower, but uh, we thank you for, for joining in any case. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers, uh, Ben Wallace and Marie Paz Canales from the MAG, who brought this all together. Some of you will have heard that uh, Under Secretary General Fabrizio Hochschild was going to be moderating this panel. He's been called away. And so I beg for your uh, sympathy as, uh, as I take over uh, the moderator's chair. My name is David Kelly. I work on Fabrizio's team and I'm in the executive office of the Secretary General. I'm providing policy advice on frontier technology governance, which I think is probably appropriate for our conversation today. The first thing I want to start is to say that, you know, the way we set policy on frontier technologies in the 21st century is going to have to be different from the 20th century, um, where it was issues like atomic energy or space, which were principally driven and organized by the state. 21st century technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, biotechnology are principally driven by the private sector, and they require different approaches and different solutions. As the Secretary General said in his speech in the opening, the treaty process that takes five to 10 years for certification, negotiation, and then ratification is simply not going to be able to keep pace with the developments and technology changes in the 21st century. So that's why our panel's here today. Um, we're here to talk about new ways, multidisciplinary ways to look at policy making. So part one, I'll bring you through an overview. Part one is going to look at how that multidisciplinary process takes place. Um, we're four distinguished colleagues on stage and thank you for joining and thank you for taking the time and lending us your expertise. Uh, part two of our conversation is going to be examples around how that multidisciplinary policy making uh, works and doesn't work. And we're going to hope for examples of both. 
So let me start by introducing the distinguished panelists we have at the top here. Um, Molly Lesher. Thank you, Molly, for joining. Senior Policy Analyst with the OECD. Um, Molly's experience is with supporting uh, governments mostly in digital economic policy, um, but her background in and of itself is multidisciplinary, having served uh, with Fidelity Investments in the private sector and with the U.S. Federal Reserve. So uh, thanks for the balance there and for joining. Uh, Sophie Parison. Hello, Sophie. Thanks for joining. Uh, Director of um, Innovation for All Team at the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, she's also the Director of ICC Basis. And the ICC BASIS program, which is a terrific program, facilitates business input and communications technology. And her background is incredibly diverse, also multidisciplinary. It's a trend. Not, not only do we have multi-stakeholders, but the individuals themselves are multidisciplinary. It's really impressive. Um, Sophie's background is in law, international relations, and medicine, and technology. Uh, terrific to have you. Uh, Sheetal Kumar uh, from uh, Global Partners Digital is a program officer there. Uh, she tells expertise in cybersecurity, capacity building especially, and also in areas of cybercrime and civil society engagement. So we're really looking forward to having your inputs as well. And at the end, on my far left, is uh, the Honorable Safari Nishuti, who is a member of parliament for the Masisi area of North Kivu in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, Safari's interest in parliament, mostly in the area of telecom and IT infrastructure, but also youth and gender. Uh, prior to serving in parliament, and again, multidisciplinary, um, uh, Safari was the chief technology officer of Sukiza Network in North Kivu province, which is in the far east of the DRC. So thank you for joining. The way we'll run it today is that we'll have uh, a series of introductory comments from our panel members, and then I will ask one follow-up question, and then we'll go to the audience for questions from there. We'll hope to take three or four in the first session, and the same in the second session. So the first session, and I'll start uh, obviously with Molly here, what we're looking at is uh, what should truly multidisciplinary policymaking processes look like? And I know that's, that's a complex word salad to a certain degree. We're hoping you can kind of distill it for us from the OECD's perspective. How does that, how does that look? And, and I know you're going to take the stage to show, take the podium to show a slide for us. So thanks for that. So thanks so much. It's a real great uh, pleasure to be here, uh, realizing the opportunities and addressing the challenges of digital transformation is not automatic, and I think it's important that we all acknowledge that. People, firms, governments, and all stakeholders really need to be involved in shaping uh, a digital future that makes the most of the immense opportunities we know that digital transformation holds to improve the lives of all people. Now with the OECD, uh, we've been working on the OECD Going Digital Project, uh, which brought together over 20 different policy communities in a two and a half year process. That's basically everyone apart from national security to develop a strategy to make di digital transformation positive and inclusive. And the resulting effort is the Going Digital Integrated Policy Framework that you see up there on the slide. We also have a companion online Going Digital uh, Toolkit, and it has seven policy dimensions. The first one is enhancing access to communications, infrastructure, services, and data. The second is increasing effective use of digital technologies and data. The third is unleashing data-driven and digital innovation. The fourth is about ensuring good jobs for all, and the key there is good. The fifth is about promoting social prosperity and inclusion. The sixth is about strengthening trust. And the seventh is about fostering market openness in digital business environments. Um, each of these dimensions brings together multiple policy domains uh, that re require effective coordination. And this approach really underscores that all seven are needed to make digital transformation work for growth and well-being. You can have the very best broadband infrastructure and the very best services, but if people don't trust the internet, they're not going to use it. If people don't have the skills to use digital technologies effectively, the promises of digital transformation diminish. So these seven dimensions really highlight the complex and interrelated nature of digital transformation, and I think they also help put into relief some of the trade-offs between public policy objectives that we know must be made. Now, all of this is in the book that's at the, uh, the table there, if you're interested, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about the framework. 
Now, many countries have a digital economy strategy or an equivalent policy in place, but really only a few promote truly the whole of government approach as outlined in this framework. Key elements of such an approach include clear priorities, objectives, and measurable targets, well-defined responsibilities, ensuring coherence between a digital transformation strategy and other domestic and international objectives, for example, the SDGs, sufficient budget that's allocated to the implementing ministry or body, and here we're talking about line items, and also thorough monitoring and evaluation. Now, we all know that coordination and cooperation across ministries and bodies and different levels of government uh, is hard. We also know it must involve all stakeholders, but how to do that practically will really vary what we've seen based on the existing institutions, how the government's structured, and cultural factors. But what is clear is that digital technologies can help improve this process. I've seen some experiments uh, of public consultations using social media to get direct citizen input on potential policy changes. So the innovations are happening not just at the technological level, but within the, uh, the policy making process itself. And this is really something that should be embraced. Now at the bottom of the slide you see a URL to our online Going Digital Toolkit which help go helps governments in developing and successfully implementing an effective strategy. And it provides key resources including indicators and policy guidance. And I'm absolutely delighted to say that last week we won a gold star award at an international competition on interactive data visualization. So I won't feel bad if you pick up your mobile phone and check it out. Uh, please do, please let us know uh, what you think. Now some of the guidance that is on the toolkit is in the form of soft law, principles and best practices. For instance, in May, the OECD adopted uh, a recommendation on artificial intelligence, the first intergovernmental standard uh, in this area. And other soft law instruments are also included. For example, we have a recommendation on protecting children online. We have the OECD privacy guidelines. And we're working on principles uh, on enhancing access to and sharing of data. Now, all of these instruments are paired to the uh, different seven dimensions that are up there and can be found online. So uh, please do check it out, and please check it out as we elaborate the toolkit going forward. Thanks very much. Thanks, Molly. That's terrific. And congratulations on that, uh, on that award. I'm going to pick up a little bit on that just for a very quick follow-up question. You talked a little bit about um, the AI principles, and it's a huge achievement for your organization. And you've achieved something that I think nobody else has done yet, which is uh, intergovernmental agreement on AI principles that are now being adopted everywhere and elsewhere. And I think a big part of the G20 statement uh, was reflective of the success you had. You talked about trade-offs and you talked about consultations. How maybe did that impact on the work you guys did on the AI principles? Was, was there trade-offs? Was there, uh, how did you do the, the consultation process? So the consultation process was a true multi-stakeholder initiative. There was a lot of discussion, uh, arguments about defining uh, what AI is and how it should be sort of implemented in a trustworthy way. I think it, uh, ultimately the principles are pretty high level and they were high enough level to get this broad agreement. The devil is a little bit in the details and that's where we are right now. I have uh, colleagues, some of them may be in the audience now, who are working on practical guidance for implementing these principles. This is a process that's going through uh, our committee right now, and the ultimate result of that will be uh, an online AI policy observatory that will launch in February that will have a little bit more details on how to practically implement. You're never going to have one size fits all for all countries, but this will at least help give some sort of broad contours. Thank you. That was an incredibly detailed and organized answer to a question you didn't know in advance. That was imp it's very impressive. Okay, Sophie, um, maybe you can give us a, a few minutes as well from the, uh, from the podium there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I first wanted to thank the organizers for inviting us this afternoon. We're delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Sophie Parrison. I am working for the International Chamber of Commerce. We represent 35 million businesses uh, throughout the world in over 100 countries. Uh, with uh, 90 uh, national committees. We turn 100 years old this year. I uh, hope it doesn't show too much. Uh, and we work on a variety of issues in terms of advocacy making, standard setting, and uh, we work very much in a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-stakeholder approach, and I'm looking forward to, to talking to you more about that. So since uh, the beginning of the IGF this week, I have to say I've been quite struck by how much I've heard of the 3.9 billion people who are on let, on, uh, sorry, online connected, etc. But of course, that begs the question of all of those uh, that are not. And, um, this is a challenge that governments alone cannot meet, and that's why the business sector uh, very much uh, works with uh, governments, civil society, the tech industry, um, and of course business to be able to, to meet that challenge. And it's with that in mind that I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about our vision of what we mean by the uh, multi-stakeholder approach. We are uh, com committed and convinced that a culture of cooperation should be encouraged across the entire digital and ICT ecosystem at all levels of decision making and the subnational to the global levels. The, this leads to opportunities for mutual learning and assisting one another. Fit for purpose decisions, flexible and adaptable policies, reciprocated respect for stakeholders' interest. In practice, this requires a conscious and continuous effort to adopt, implement, integrate, monitor, and improve a multi-stakeholder approach to policy and regulatory decision-making, as well as a holistic consideration of policy issues as they relate to ICT across the entire ICT ecosystem and at all levels of decision-making. In this respect, we guide our work with the three I's, implement, integrate, and improve. So what do we mean by implement? Well, it's about opening up the traditional policy-making processes to the input of all stakeholders. That can be done through a number of ways, whether it's through uh, public consultation or targeted outreach to organizations across the policy spectrum. Because we believe that this will help valuable and complementary input from those that are involved in or affected by the decisions made. This should include organizations from both the demand and the supply side of technology. It is vital to see partnerships and share information with stakeholders and organizations regionally and globally in an effort to address common issues, reduce complexity, and avoid duplication. The second I that I talk to you is about integrating, and that's what this uh, eye-catching graph is all about. I recently dubbed it the virtuous circle, and I'm going to walk you through it uh, to just, uh, because we've conceptualized what we, we mean by this multi-stakeholder approach. It was designed by the International Chamber's uh, Commission on the Digital Economy uh, to help consider a holistic and multi-stakeholder approach to policy making. At the center, you will find the infrastructure, applications and services, and user engagement layers that make up the ICT ecosystem. These highlight the foundational role of ICT and how the different ICT functions are built on top of each other to deliver value to users. The multi-layered ring represents the different policy issues, be they economic, technical, social, cultural, or governance issues that arise through the use and development of ICT. These policy issues can be overlapping and need to be, sorry, and need the experience and expertise of relevant stakeholders, for example, business, civil society, technical community and government, basically all of you in the room, if they are to be addressed effectively. Moving along, the ring around the policy issues represents the stakeholders that I've just mentioned, and finally, what is bringing us all together, the SDGs. These layers mutually build and support one another, and their proper functioning depends on effective cooperation across and between actors in each layer. 
Just as Molly, I'm going to refer you to a publication that we issued a few years ago if you want to know a bit more about our work. It's the ICC's policy statement on ICT, Policy and Sustainable Economic Development. For those of you who are not familiar with the uh, publication, I invite you to, to have a look. The last I that I want to refer back to is about improving, because it's great to establish these frameworks and everybody's happy with uh, the establishment of them, but they do need to be reviewed. In order to remain effective and responsive, processes should be continually monitored and evaluated. Work on improving multi-stakeholder participation should involve inputs from multiple stakeholders, a shared understanding of the issues and desire to collaborate to address the issues, the existence of trust among stakeholders. Our conclusion is one that you know very well, is that there is no one size fits all to achieve cooperation on digital issues. Different issues and in different parts of the world will require multiple and diverse considerations. So you, you might be asking me, great, you've got this wonderful eye-catching uh, diagram here, and you're telling me about how you work, but I thought I'd, I'd tell you about a, an initiative that we've recently launched, that our Secretary General launched on day zero, so that feels like a while ago, uh, of the IGF, which is called Making Technology Work for All. This is a new initiative of, of our innovation hub at the ICC, um, where we're putting into practice multi this multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, we're, we're committing through this initiative in working with members and partners to ensure that access to internet and digital technologies work on all three layers of the digital ecosystem, meaning infrastructure, applications, and skills. We also want to work with policymakers. I've actually been struck by the number of times I've heard about the skill gap among policymakers um, to, to bring them on board and to engage with them in, in, a, in an informed way. Uh, it's also about co-creating incentives for investment and innovation and co-design of frameworks that enable connectivity based on light-touch ICT policy and regulations. And finally, another way that we would like to implement this multi-stakeholder approach is also by mobilizing the very broad network that we have within the International Chamber of Commerce, which is, as I mentioned, 35 million businesses, and that's 12,000 chambers and over 90 national committees. We've been able to do this in another area that is uh, uh, very high on the agenda of the international community, which is uh, climate change. We launched a, a coalition in uh, September, uh, right before the, the UNGA, and my understanding is that we have over 1,200 uh, chambers that are mobilized. So I think you know, we can do better than that community, so please join us in, in, in this multi-stakeholder uh, adventure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sophie, and congratulations on the centenary. Uh, implement, integrate, and improve three eyes. Maybe I can propose a fourth and see if you can uh, provide some feedback there. The idea would be around intersection. We're talking about multidisciplinary approaches. When you think about the implementation, the integration, and the improvement, where do you find that you've needed to have the most stakeholder engagement between those three processes, or is it equal across all three? Or are you finding that one really, uh, maybe it's the improvement or the implementation, where do you need that really multidisciplinary approach? I would say that we need it throughout, because if we don't have a multidisciplinary approach from the outset, we could just be shaping the agenda in a skewed way. Uh, I think it's really absolutely critical that we get all the right players from the outset, get the critical questions uh, on the agenda, and make sure that we have the right tools uh, and that we're, we're held to account. Uh, in terms of improving as well, because that it's gone. But that wonderful uh, diagram that's there, um, I think it's a very useful framework, but it needs to be continuously adapted and, and challenged. I think, you know, that's the most important thing. We live in a challenging context uh, for multiple reasons, and I think we need to be very uh, constructive in the way that we, we've, we find solutions. I don't think that one single community can find a solution on, on its own. That makes sense. That's helpful. In innovation and then investigation of your own processes, maybe six eyes. Uh, okay, thank you. Sheetal uh, Kumar, please, um, from the Global Partners Digital. Thank you so much, David. It's always so great to be at the IGF where I think um, there is an explicit acceptance 
um, an understanding of the value of a multidisciplinary approach. I think it's really at the beating heart of, of the IGF and its mission um, to recognize the importance of having um, all perspectives considered, and that's why we're all here. So it makes a lot of sense, this panel. So thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak, um, and also to the panel organizers. So Global Partners Digital uh, is a champion um, of, of the uh, multi-stakeholder approach. And we, we believe in the importance of an open, inclusive, and transparent approach. And what we've done is develop a framework, which we've tried and tested, um, based on our experience of working with a variety of stakeholders on internet policy issues, and also so drawing on the experience of others in, in the field and also in other fields. And the way we understand it, there are three main aspects to a policy process. There's the scoping, there's a process formation, and then there's the drafting. And there are four characteristics that should underpin each of these aspects of, the, of, of, of a policy making process. They are openness and inclusivity, their openness and accessibility, inclusivity, a consensus-based approach, and transparency and accountability. So I'm just going to go into those very briefly um, before I, I go on to some of the challenges um, that, that can be faced as well and, and how those challenges can be overcome in, in a multidisciplinary policy-making process. So an openness and accessibility, what does that actually mean? Well, it means are there are the opportunities for relevant stakeholder engagement communicated in a timely manner? Um, this could be um, considering are all people um, of all backgrounds and abilities um, considered and, and any barriers to their participation considered from the outset. Those barriers might be financial, they might be geographical, they might be lang language barriers. But those need to be considered um, so that a process is truly accessible and open. Is a process inclusive? This means are all relevant stakeholders given the opportunity to contribute? Are there different views taken into consideration? Are inputs published? Are they made public? Um, are the deliberations informed and evidence-based? And thirdly, consensus driven. This is really important. Are dissenting views taken into account and documented? And then finally, but very importantly as well, I'm sure we'll all agree, is transparency and accountability. Transparent procedures and mechanisms are absolutely essential to a multidisciplinary um, policy process that is effective. And some of the factors we think that should be considered in this are disclosure of stakeholder interests and affiliations, clarity, um, effectiveness of um, internal lines of accountability, mechanisms for ensuring discussions are documented, decisions are explained. Uh, one thing we often hear a lot of is um, when, when asked who needs to be considered, who should be invited to the table. So the question is uh, how do you identify relevant stakeholders? So our response to that is relevant stakeholders are those with a direct interest and expertise in the issue at hand, but it's really important to recognize that that doesn't, um, that, well, that shouldn't be uh, restrictive in any way. And, and certainly when it comes to civil society, I think sometimes there's a tendency to, to pigeonhole civil society stakeholders. But civil society um, represents a very broad um, range of actors. Um, and, you know, there's so many, so much depth of expertise and breadth of expertise that civil society stakeholders can bring to the table, uh, whether it's devising policy solutions, technical solutions to policy challenges, community building, collecting an evidence base, um, and doing research. So there, there's really a wide range um, of, of expertise there, and that needs to be considered when identifying relevant stakeholders. Just quickly on the challenges. Um, Really, I think on challenges of implementing multidisciplinary policy approaches, it, it depends on the context um, and on the issue at hand. One area we've been working a lot on is on cybersecurity um, policy processes, and there, there's often um, this perception that because it's um, a security issue, there's only a select number of uh, stakeholders that, that should be invited to the table, but actually, cybersecurity is a shared responsibility, um, and so it, it, that, that processes like that need to be m more open. There's also this idea idea that doing multidisciplinary or multi-stakeholder approaches is expensive, time-consuming, resource-intensive. Um, and I think that's where also we would say, actually further down the line, if you involve everyone at the outset, it's less expensive, it's less time consuming in the long run because you get the buy-in of the relevant stakeholders who need to implement the policy. And like I just said, you, you have a, a breadth of expertise and that can also be cost saving in the long run. Um, and then in some contexts, trust is an issue. There isn't always trust between different stakeholders. Again, transparency is essential to building trust. 
Finally, what are the underlying conditions for creating and continuously supporting this environment? Well, the first is there needs to be genuine commitment um, from those who are leading the process, and this obviously often tends to be governments. It can't be a tick box exercise. It needs to be, there needs to be genuine commitment from government for the, um, for the multidisciplinary approach, and indeed from all stakeholders. Um, that's really, really important. And some things that we've, we've found that are really useful for that is institutionalizing commitments between government, within government ministries and agencies, having actors within government and other stakeholders champion the approach and even at the international level champion it. And then another thing, and this is my final point, is that it's really important to consider ongoing engagement, which is something that you mentioned, Sophie, and that's the, um, the need to engage stakeholders throughout the process from the beginning to the end and then to implementation because piecemeal approaches are not as effective. If, if stakeholders are only invited um, at the drafting stage or only at the implementation stage, it undermines the effectiveness of the approach. So all of these things are connected. Um, I, I think that would be my final point. Open processes lead to more informed dialogue, more transparency leads to trust, and stakeholders who trust together can collaborate better, um, and in the end you have a better outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chital. You talked about transparency as being essential, and you touched on it a few times, but what I want to really dig into is how do you ensure that transparency is maintained both internally in the process, across internal stakeholders, and then externally in the broader public view? I think looking in the 21st century model of policymaking as opposed to maybe to the 20th century, the need for transparency is paramount. And how do you ensure that in these kind of processes? Um, yeah, that, that, that's an absolutely essential question. Um, I think there are lots of different ways, uh, some of those I mentioned um, um, just now, uh, for ensuring transparency. And, and it's really important from the outset to be clear about what the objectives of a process is, why stakeholders are being invited, what kind of inputs they're expected to bring, publishing um, the, uh, the elements of a, a discussion um, that is had between stakeholders, and making sure that's easily accessible. Again, I think these are all interlinked elements. Um, is, is really important and, and like I said that, that builds trust further down the line and, I, and we now have so many tools at our disposable for, for transparency, for ensuring that everyone has the information they need to make uh, meaningful contributions to a process, is able to follow them and then able to support the implementation of a, of a policy. It's a good point. You know, the excuses aren't there anymore. There's so many platforms to make things public and accessible and transparent. Um, it makes you worry when it's not, and so I think that's a really good point. Um, thank you, Shital. Our final speaker of the first session, uh, the Honorable Safari Nushuti. Um, obviously, you know, as, as, a, as the lone politician at the table, you come without notes just based on your own charisma. Uh, so please, I give you the floor. <laughs> I'm Ayubangira Safari. I'm an MP from the DRC. I say I didn't have any note and I didn't plan to come to speak on this uh, stage. I was thinking I would just speak on that chair, uh, sitting there. But my ladies all, all came here, so I have to come also and have the chance to speak on the same mic that Ajira Michael has speak. This chance came once, once in a lifetime, so I cannot skip that one. But my concern at this point, when we come on policy making and digital area, something changed because in the previous time, when we was making policy, people was thinking that policy is just a business, uh, is something from the business, from the lawyer, from the state. They are just waiting for uh, to get the policy informed about the policy and the policy implemented and see how they will abide to that uh, uh, policy. But now with the a digital age, now internet is not just something that belongs to the government. It's something that belongs, first of all, to the citizen. They own internet. So when we want to make a policy that will affect internet, we have to, think to, we have, to have all the view from all the stakeholders. And the stakeholder on internet is not only the countries, it's all the humanity. And the humanity is made by various stakeholders, various uh, social groups that have different point of view. Before I came here, I just take a lunch. After lunch, I went to uh, the restroom, and there I saw something, something that very small, but with great meaning. 
I just saw a graffiti on the door. And my thinking was, this guy who have made that gravity, is it normal? Is it normal? Is it serious? How can a normal guy put a, a such dirty nonsense things on the, on the clean white door? And then I noticed that I'm no longer young as I was thinking because when I was young also, I'm, I could see that graphic as a art, but now I'm seeing it as a crime. That's how it thinks when, when you see on the age aspect, young people think differently than old people. And I know that some, some, some of you can think that I'm still young, but uh, I still am enough old because at the time uh, the Berlin Wall was broken, I was already there. I was not in Berlin, but I saw it on the TV. I was already in primary school, so don't just see my face. I'm still, I'm, I'm old enough. Uh, and on that aspect of policy making, multidisciplinary, we have to think about all the, all the part of the stakeholders, not only on the country I say, but all, who are evolved in the internet business. We have the citizen, we are, they are looking on the, the social society, a society, they look after how human rights can be pro, a protected on internet, how internet can help to get that human right a protected, how can internet help us to have more democracy, more freedom, how internet itself can remain free. But we have also the business a society, the business a community who have made internet. They need also to, to still have the capability to, to bring more innovation, to bring more good platform and good stuff on internet. And from that, they need also some specific a policy. We have to have a view from input from all those guys who make internet. But also we need also to have input for those one who think internet, they are not their priority. I came from a, a country in Congo where we have other priority. We have a priority of uh, peace, we have priority of, uh, we have a problem of war. So when we came, when I will go back in my country and, and, and try to convince our parliament to speak about internet governance, they will say, you guys, you are joking. People are, are dying in the East and you, you came just well with uh, internet governance. I think we should also think about those people who, who, on their point of view, internet is not their priority. Because once the policy will be implemented, they will be affected in a way or in other. So we also, we also need to have tools that will be able to get input from, from those people, from those social groups, from those countries who doesn't put internet on their priority because the time it will be implemented, they will be also affected. And I think on the, when time will come, we'll have to speak also on that one. How can we also make sure that those who are not with us today, they are also, their view, they, we will be able to catch up their view. I don't know if they will have some people from uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Djibouti, if we have people from the refugee community, the real refugee, not the, NGO, the delegate from NGO who deal with the refugee, the UNHCR, the Red Cross, but the real refugee. What do they think about artificial intelligence? What do they think about blockchain? What do they think about a digital identity? Because now it's being applied on their life, but I don't know if they, before applying it, they have also provided their input. That's what I want also to bring on this panel, how to think about how to get view and make sure we have view input from those one who are not present with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Safari. The question I want to ask, we talk about multidisciplinary, but I think you highlighted a piece that I want to focus on, which is youth. And I, I know you're quite young, you talk about the youth, I think it's a terrific compliment to that. The flight from Goma to Kinshasa is three hours. 
and we have a lot of parliamentarians that have to fly long distances to legislate on behalf of the people in their community. How is it you're able to include youth voices uh, in the conversations that you're having in the capital, legislation that affects them like digital ID, uh, legislation like artificial intelligence? How are you able to integrate the thoughts of the youth into your legislative processes? In our country, we have an issue really with, uh, uh, after election, uh, sometimes we find that we are somehow disconnected with the, our voter. They just elected us, but after that, we, are not, we don't keep uh, in touch with them. They don't know really the work we are doing there, and that's because of the, the distance. We have about more three hours from Kinshasa to Goma, and we go there twice a year only, and it's not all, all the parliament that go back to provide their feedback. So, but at least we have a good tool now with uh, internet that help to reduce the distance. We, we keep in touch with uh, those one who can at least have, have access to the information. Uh, it's not all the uh, people that uh, have like the WhatsApp. The WhatsApp is a very useful tool that uh, keep people together and exchange on time on life. But we still have, uh, in, uh, like in our country, in, the, in those remote area, I was very surprised uh, during the, uh, the campaign. When I was doing the campaign, I go in the remote area where they, they just leave uh, the civil war every day. But after each meeting, there was about two or three people that called me uh, aside and said, no, I'm the one who was speaking with you on Facebook. And I found oh, here on this village, we have also Facebook. And that's a good thing. So I think those uh, uh, tool, uh, internet tool, can help us to 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 make democracy more go deeper, even our in our village, and overcome the challenge we have on our own infrastructure, on the transport issue, on other uh, infrastructure we have. That tool we use that tool, and uh, but it's done on case by case. But what it should be, it should have been like done by the parliament, make sure that all the parliament use those tools and uh, as much as possible to, to keep in touch with, uh, with uh, the electors because after that, after five years, and what's, that's what's happening in our country, uh, most of the people think that in the, our country are not yet democratic, but I can say it's really democratic. Maybe the, the one who are elected are the people who are not a democratic but at least the election is being made. And after five years, we found that most 80% of the government of the parliament is renewed. People will vote other people because of what they say, we didn't make something for us. And on my side, I find also it's a problem for those people because you vote for someone and you don't make even the follow up to make sure that they are doing what you are supposed to do for you. And that's an issue, and I hope uh, with a, a good internet, it will help us to, to make more life the democracy. That's brilliant. That's an excellent example of a positive impact that the internet can have, especially on the democratic processes worldwide. Um, that's our four speakers for the first session. We're now going to open it to, to Q&A uh, from the floor for about 10 minutes. I think I'll probably be able to take about three questions. Um, so if we can just open up the floor, um, one, two, and the first two there, and then uh, three, three oh, we get three here. So let's start here on the left, gentlemen. Could you make sure you let us know who you are and which organization you're from, please? Thank you. Hello, my, <clears throat> my name is Damien Tambini. I'm from the London School of Economics. I'm here at the invitation of the UK government, but I'm speaking in a personal capacity. I'm just wondering if I can put a proposition to the panel. And the proposition is that we are, in fact, entering a new phase in multi-stakeholderism. And many of the assumptions that this process can be led um, by business, as was suggested by the chair, um, or can be limited to a limited range of stakeholders, as was suggested by one of the panelists, um, those assumptions no longer hold. I think Safari's suggestion that really uh, everybody is a stakeholder um, 
really has some quite deep roots and they are something that we should acknowledge. What has changed? The um, concerns about democracy are existential, so fake news and deliberate misinformation um, change the game fundamentally, so new kinds of policy solutions, fake news laws, new forms of accountability are on the table, they are being discussed. Um, and secondly, national security. So um, <clears throat> questions of disinformation are not only viewed within a domestic lens, they are concerns about uh, sovereignty and external interference with the workings of democracies. So in that environment, with a much wider set of policy solutions being discussed, particularly at the national level, is it not the case that a new form of uh, multi-stakeholderism uh, might need to be uh, relevant? Uh, and uh, how, given that there are new kinds of policy solutions on the table, will it be possible to make those solutions legitimate, given that we're dealing with uh, control of speech and control of processes of opinion formation and the division between the control of platforms over speech and governments and the law. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to take two more questions and then I'll open it up to the panel for response. Thank you very much for those insights. Uh, the second gentleman here on the left. Thank you. Steve Delbianco with NetChoice. Uh, I'd like to know whether the panelists have evaluated the, the measurement question. That is, how do we measure whether the means that you're prescribing actually make a difference? Um, Safari, for instance, could go home to the Congo and implement a transparent, youth-driven, multidisciplinary implementation of the toolkit and the virtuous circle. But how do we know if that is necessary and sufficient to make a difference in people's lives? Will individuals, businesses, and orgs actually be able to do free enterprise and free expression? Will they be able to expand their supply chain in a digital way and reach digital markets around the world for their products and services? So how do you measure whether any of this works. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That's, that's well received. Um, gentleman there at the back, yes. We're going to have time for one more as well after this. Thank you for keeping your questions brief. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Arsene Tungali. Uh, I'm actually from the DRC, and I'm a member of the MAG. So I'd like to echo somehow what uh, Mr. Safari just said, you know, about the complexity of the context you know, within which the country is, uh, is operating. Uh, I'm one of, I mean, I lead a nonprofit that uh, deals with human rights and access to the ICTs. And um, the issue of us engaging you know, with MPs and parliamentarians, whereas I live in Goma, which is far away from, you know, from Kinshasa, the main issue is for us during our advocacy work, you know, to uh, bring our inputs into the policy making process, which makes it hard because you either need to travel and it takes you like three hours on a plane to be in Kinshasa. And so the use of the internet has been, you know, uh, helpful for us because you don't need necessarily to travel to Kinshasa to be able you know, to bring your inputs uh, to the MPs so they can be considered during their, you know, their, their, their policy making processes. But the other issue is not all the MPs use the internet, right? And so you may be able to send emails to all of them, but not all of them are using their emails, so making it hard for all of them to be able to receive the inputs that you are having. And so in this uh, digital age, I think it's um, instrumental and it's very useful and important for everyone to be able you know, to start using technology so they can keep in touch you know, with uh, the rest of the people and this specifically the case for MPs in order to stay in touch with, uh, with uh, the people on the ground. Thank you for that, that's a, that's a clever intervention. I just wanna make sure we get, okay, a gentleman in the front here. Thank you, David. Alejandro Pisanti from the National University of Mexico, former member of the Working Group on Internet Governance, Boards of ICANN and ISOC, and a couple other things uh, years ago. Uh, two things. First, I don't think it's wise to use the word multi-stakeholderism because it suggests a religion, an ideology, a belief 
it's much more important to think about multi-stakeholder governance and where it is actually appropriate. There's a lot of precedents in the governance of the environment, of sports, of finance, uh, local, commons, global, many, in many regions, reasons. For the ICC and the Shital Kumar's intervention, I would add that there, if you think of that as a practical thing, what's missing is uh, giving shape to the exact mechanisms that you need for each case. In some cases, you need really complex structures with uh, mechanisms for redressal of bad decisions and accountability. In other cases, like the IGF, you need an open forum and uh, much more open rules. And the things that you are trying to impose or construct governance for are less and less the internet itself and more and more conduct that's made by humans or their agents, like people, governments, companies, or software. And we know how to govern those, or we don't know how to govern those equally on or offline. Like disinformation campaigns, like fake news, it's the, the new name, but it's, you know, Ron Fender Laquila, 1996, by the, by the line of the book. And we should look more and more at what the underlying conduct is and how it is modified by the internet instead of putting it all together as internet governance. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Okay, so we have about uh, 10 minutes remaining, so enough time for two, two minutes from each of our panelists around. We heard issues of uh, a new form of multi-stakeholderism to increase the legitimacy of the process. We heard about um, questions on how we make sure we measure progress in these, in, in these kinds of discussions. Um, we talked about accountability, keeping members of parliament accountable, keeping decision makers accountable. And we talked about transparency and how we can ensure that that is uh, very much at the forefront of our thoughts. So um, maybe Molly, I'll start with you and then, uh, and then go down the line, please. Thank you. So thanks a lot for all of those questions. Um, with respect to whether we're in a new phase of multi-stakeholder governance, I don't know if we're in a new phase or if we just need to use different tools to make it work. So as I was mentioning before, I have seen uh, experiments using Facebook to try to get direct citizen uh, input on possible new legislation. And it wasn't a one-off thing, it was over several months saying, if we do this, we would have to decrease support for this. Do you agree with that? And I think that was a really interesting way to get more people uh, involved in the process. I coordinate the Going Digital Project, which is really, really complicated. I have over 20 uh, committees. I may only have uh, 36 countries, but they aren't always unified with one position. I've had to balance the perspectives of so many people. Uh, the more that you have, the harder it is, but I think ultimately, uh, I hope, anyway, the book and the analysis is richer for it. Measurement is one of my absolute favorite topics. I hope you absolutely look at our Going Digital Toolkit. We spent an awful long time working with national statistics agencies trying to map core indicators to each of the seven different dimensions of the framework I mentioned to show countries where they stand, where the, what their state of digital development is, and then how to develop policies in response. Now, what you're talking about is impacts, and impacts is a lot harder to measure. Uh, it's something that we are going to be working on at the OECD. Right now, we are look, using microdata to think about uh, diffusion of digital technologies and what some of those impacts uh, are. That's really hard, getting cross-country comparable microdata, but it is something uh, that we're working on. It's also something that's part of our Going Digital Measurement Roadmap, which is a companion publication uh, to, this, to this book that I have here, and I think making sure that all countries, uh, IOs, other bodies are moving the measurement agenda, s sort of pushing the boat forward in the same direction is absolutely important. If you don't know where you stand, if you don't know what the impacts uh, are going to be, how do you develop an appropriate policy response? I think that's absolutely critical. That sounds great, thanks. I like the idea of new tools to help Im implement new tools. 
At the risk of repeating what Molly has just uh, mentioned, um, are, indeed, are we entering a new phase? I would know. The diagram that I use this afternoon should not be seen in any way as a straitjacket. It's really a starting point, uh, and it's put on the table in order to initiate a, a conversation. It really does need to be questioned at every single initiative that we take. Uh, the list was not meant to be exhaustive uh, either, um, and, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's proven useful to us in our work. Um, is, but again, it's, uh, I don't think that we have a, a rigid approach, and, uh, and in some circumstances it really is useful to have that, uh, to be able to prompt the interlocutors that we're working with, that we have this commitment to be working in an inclusive, transparent way. I, have, I wasn't able for um, lack of time to talk about our commitment uh, also to accountability and, and inclusiveness. Um, but um, at, it has been at the core of the work that we're doing at the ICC and will continue to be, because otherwise I think we'll just be completely irrelevant tomorrow. Um, as for um, measurement, I also completely agree. I think it's at the core of the third of my eyes uh, in terms of improvement. Uh, I don't see how we can uh, improve and we can learn and, and we can also justify what we've done if we don't measure. Um, I think it's also... Um, looking at a more sustainable initiative, we would need to measure what we've done to understand how we continue and how we can help stakeholders continue uh, in, in that role. Thank you. That, that sounds great, Sophie. Um, Chitelle. Yes, thank you. Um, on the question of whether multi-stakeholderism needs to change, not multi-stakeholderism, Alejandro, <laughs> you wouldn't be happy with me using that term, but w whatever we call it, the multi-stakeholder approach or the multidisciplinary approach, um, an open, inclusive, and transparent approach, whether that is changing. I think what is changing is the complexity of the issues um, and what shouldn't change or what mustn't change is a need to abide by those principles of openness and accessibility, of inclusivity and of transparency. Um, and so how we do that, some of the, the means will be technical, some of them will just be simply doing what is quite low-tech stuff um, that is not currently being done in, in certain areas and that needs to be done. So um, I think there are some easy lifts and then there are some challenges which will require a multi-stakeholder approach to address and to build those technical solutions as well. And on that point, um, Damien, that you made about you know, who is a relevant stakeholder, I completely agree that in, in today's day and age, the digital age, everyone is a relevant stakeholder, actually. Um, everyone is being impacted, even if you're not connected to the internet, you are impacted by the decisions related to the internet and to the internet's governance, um, the governance of digital technologies. So the, if we think of it you know, the, as a puzzle that needs to be solved, some of these issues, the pieces of the puzzle are scattered everywhere, um, and they all need to be brought together, and I think that, that that's really essential is how we address that challenge, um, but, but we need to keep in mind the need to um, underpin um, the, the approach with the, the principles that I spoke about. Um, on the need for monitoring and... Um, Evaluation, absolutely, that's really essential, and, and that goes back to my point about the need to include all stakeholders from the get-go, um, in, in, including in the monitoring and evaluation process. Um, one thing I would say about um, developing um, solutions to the challenges that we're facing in a multidisciplinary approach, in a, a way is that it's essential not only because um, we need the, the policy solutions to reflect the perspectives of everyone, but actually, the people that you engage shape the outcomes, and, and the outcomes reflect the values and perspectives of the people you engage, and it's essential that whatever solutions we come up with reflect, um, refle reflect the values and perspectives of everyone. Um, I think I'm missing one of the questions. Okay, so I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shital. Safari, to, to wrap up our first one. Uh, uh, I will just speak about uh, the last one, about... Uh, how we can make sure that uh, the things are being Im implemented, what it, it, it has been decided once we are back, the, those things are being implemented really. The first thing we have to know that implementation will, at the end, will come up, will come from, from the government a responsibility to implement those uh, policy. But when we are working on the, on the policy, when we are, uh, Making on those one, we found that uh, people who are um, putting much input are uh, either from the social, uh, so, uh, the, so, the civil uh, society, because once uh, people is engaged in a civil uh, society, it has something, uh, it's, it's like a passion. 
So he has he really, he wants those things to be to happen. He will make, he will give input, he will make all the effort to make those things happen. Uh, and other part is also the business, because when there's uh, money, money to, in, in money there, they will they'll make sure that those things, they, it will happen. But at the end, it's not uh, either the civil society or the business who will implement the, the, uh, the policy. It will become from the government. And the uh, government have also other uh, prior, uh, priority, have many uh, priority. It will not uh, focus on that one only and make sure that it, it is implemented. So we need a follow-up. And that follow-up should come from those one who have passion of that of passion. We, we should put also, when we put, when we are making a policy, we should also make, put in place some kind of control to make sure of a follow-up on that one. And everything should be also, uh, I don't remember exactly the meaning, the acronym of SMART, objective. Okay? I don't remember all the S-M-A-R-T, but I know there's a measurable, achievable, realistic, and something like that. We have to put some objectives that are really clear and on the field have people that are part of the big team who can make the follow-up. And, and trigger alert when we find that we are maybe uh, we are getting out of time because of the, the timing, the, uh, the delay. And that's the job of major of the member here who are uh, who belongs to the civil uh, society because then they act uh, with passion. They act with passion, and that's passion that makes things happen. Thank you, Safari. So we had questions on ensuring legitimacy. How do we measure progress? How do we ensure accountability of our leaders? And how do we ensure the process is transparent? And the brilliant answers of our panelists. We need to use new tools to tackle the complex issues we need to use them flexibly, engage flexibly with different stakeholders, and ultimately hold those responsible to account and to do all of it with passion. I hope you'll join me with a round of applause for our first panel, please. Okay, so the panelists will stay here. We're going to move now to part two, and I'll ask our stage colleagues to help us out there in bringing out the chairs. And our second phase panelist to come up to the stage, please. What we're going to be looking at in part two is specific examples around how uh, multidisciplinary policy making can succeed. Um, where it succeeds, potentially where it fails, we'll be looking for some of those examples as well. Um, hope you'll help me in welcoming uh, our four panelists, uh, Kenneth Adu Amenfo, Olaf Kolkman, Lisa Dyer, and Zoe Dame. Please come on up. Well, that's getting his own chair. I like that. <laughs> okay, thank you all for joining. Just to give you a bit of background. So beginning with Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth is uh, the executive director of the Africa Cybersecurity and Digital Rights Organization. It's a very long acronym, but um, he, he, Kenneth was instrumental in developing Ghana's national cybersecurity policy. So we have an actual policymaker at the government level in our midst. Um, and he's also an expert on uh, state-sponsored network shutdowns, so I'm very curious to hear how, how that applies. Next to him is Olaf Kolkman. Thank you for joining, Olaf. Uh, Olaf is the Chief Internet Technology Officer of ISOC. Yeah. Someone you'll all be familiar with. Um, he's worked for 20 years at the intersection of internet technology, policy, and society. He contributed to the DNS SEC. DNS SEC. DNS SEC. Okay, well, it's one of the few rooms in the entire world where I don't have to explain that acronym. Thank you for joining us, Olaf. Uh, beside Olaf is uh, Lisa Dyer. Uh, Lisa is the director of policy at the Partnership on AI collaborating and, and, and engaging across disciplines and with multiple stakeholders in policy development around artificial intelligence. Um, Lisa, again, we talk about multidisciplinary 
engagement, multidisciplinary people up on stage uh, before working at Partnership at AI. Lisa was also at the Department of State and in the U.S. Air Force. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks for joining. Uh, at the far right is Zoe Dalme, who is the Manager of Global Affairs and Governance at Facebook. Uh, Zoe's work is principally in outreach and consultations on Facebook's oversight board. Uh, previously uh, a colleague of mine at the United Nations in the Department of Peacekeeping Affairs, and prior to that at the U.S. Department of Justice. Thank you, Zoe. In section two, what we're going to be focusing on, as I said, is examples and in practice. And I'm going to begin with you, Kenneth. If you could take us through from uh, the ACDRO perspective, how you've seen this take play out. You, uh, you can use the microphone if you're comfortable. It's right there in front of you. Yeah. It should be on. Is it? It's at the, just don't want to double check. Here we are. Yes. Um, Thank you, David, um, and um, for having me, and good afternoon to you all. Um, yes, so um, after all the um, presentation, wonderful presentation from our previous panels, I think it is obvious um, that the new sh changing shift in policy development is actually shifting from doing it for and into doing it with unlike in the previous time that it has to be developed for us and it's implemented now, we have to implement it more specifically when it comes to internet governance. The internet is for all of us and um, it's important that all stakeholders are part of, are part of this. So um, I've had opportunity to um, be part of uh, policy development um, in the area of cybersecurity and also in the area of national um, um, IGFs. Um, so I'm just going to give my perspective and examples, practical examples uh, on that. I think that in developing and having a multidisciplinary or multi-stakeholder approach, the first uh, step that we need to um, do is to actually define the policy problem and define the policy problem um, to the level of all stakeholders. So to the understanding of all stakeholders, if you are bringing the youth, the youth needs to understand what the issue is not on a high level that you know they don't even understand and they just they just come to so defining the key problem that drives the policy um, has to be key that, that's the first point that we need to do and secondly we need to um, define the stakeholder group the stakeholder group we have uh, different stakeholders but we need to define actually the group all of us, every individual, every citizen cannot be part of the, of, the, of, the, of the group of the policy development team. So you need to actually define groups. Um, for instance, um, you have the business community, you have the civil society, you have the technical community and government and all that. So you need to define the stakeholder group. And this has to be based on what the issue is and what kind of, what, 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 what the policy is actually addressing. Um, and so we talk about having the relevant stakeholders. Talk about having the relevant stakeholders. Most often than not, we think about having every uh, representation from every group. But look, if, you had, if, if the issue has to do with spectrum, why would you go get somebody who has no idea on spectrum and can, can even contribute to, to spectrum? So we are talking about selection of the stakeholder group is very key. After selecting the group, it's also important to select the representation or representative from each stakeholder group. Most often than not, we say, oh, okay, yes, we have uh, civil society as, as part of the stakeholder group. And the person who represents civil society uh, group has no idea on what, whatever is going on, you know, so um, we need to make sure that we have people who have the knowledge and awareness of the different stake, stake, stakeholder uh, um, that's, that we bring in. Most often than not, from experience, you realize that um, if you don't have an a well-established stakeholder group, it becomes difficult to identify a representative. So you get somebody from... Um, the business community to be a member of the group. He comes, sit, participate in the decision making, and then he goes out and communicate to none of the members within the stakeholder group. So, so he comes and he's part of the process, right from design, implementation, to monitoring, evaluation, but none of the other members within the civil society or business group 
or the group in which he's coming from is aware of what, what is going on. So at the end of the day, we say, oh, we have a multi-stakeholder or multidisciplinary, but it's actually one institution or one. So, so these are some of the issues. Uh, and one of the main challenges in identifying these stakeholder groups um, is awareness creation. It's lack of expertise. So you realize that um, they, they don't have the expertise, they have no idea, the awareness is not there, and we just call them and they sit into the meeting. So what we have tried to do in, 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 in the policies that have been part in developing is to first of all try to build capacity, create awareness and build capacity. For instance, if we want to get the civil society organizations to be part of policy, uh, internet governance, policy making, we try to conduct some awareness creation workshops and you know build their aware, uh, the awareness and, and whet their appetites too. And then w once that is done, they, they will be able to uh, come. I see you want to stop me, right? <laughs> <laughs> very, very subtly, because I want to pick up on one point that you're making and then follow up. We talk a lot this week about breaking down silos. But what you just explained to us is that silos are incredibly useful because silos is where the expertise is stored. stored. And when you get into those silos, you dig into that expertise. Let's not just grab anybody. Let's find the real experts within those silos, but experts within those silos that are able to network. And I think that's really the key is if we can get better networks between silos, networking people, networking processes and structures, then we'll be in a much better position to answer what I think was your first question. I want to follow up with you on how do you define the problem? How do, you, how do you decide to define the problem when various stakeholder groups have a different definition of what it is they want to solve? How do you solve that problem in a multidisciplinary way? So I think one of the effective way of uh, defining the problem is uh, the use of uh, a public forum or a public consultation such as this. Because you have, if, if, for, if you, for instance, if you take the internet, for instance, and internet governance, I mean, every, almost everybody, even the the most illiterate person in the rural areas, as I heard somebody saying, you talked about somebody using Facebook in the village, right? Yeah, almost so, so the internet is for all of us. So get everybody on board in a, in a public consultation for, forum like this, pull the issues out and let's tease it out. And at the end of the day, we'll all come to a, a conclusion or clear definition of what the issue is. That's exactly picking up on what our first panel said about using new tools to solve new problems. That makes complete sense. Thank you for that, Kenneth. I'm going to pass now to Olaf Kolkman uh, of ISOC. Olaf. Yeah, so um, um, a concrete example. I think uh, uh, that is what I want to bring to the table. Um, I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, this week I've heard a lot about uh, uh, AI uh, uh, governance and so on and so forth. A few years back, or maybe even last year, IoT was the big thing that uh, was going on in the hallway. Um, and IoT security is a complex topic. A complex topic in which uh, a harmonization is needed across policies across the world, but also it's still a very agile space in which we don't know exactly how to address these 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 issues with 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 uh, in in national legislation and so on and so forth. Um, when I think about processes that usually are effective, I usually think about bottom-up processes. Um, and one of the things that, I, uh, that I've witnessed recently is the IoT multi-stakeholder platform uh, on uh, IoT security. This, uh, this was an event that, uh, that sort of addressed all those, uh, those, those qualities that you mentioned, Shetal, on, the, on, the, on, on, on addressing a topic. Um, it was initiated by six different organizations. Uh, the Innovation Science Economic Development uh, Canada, it's a ministry in Canada. The Internet Society, our organization. CIPIC, uh, uh, a public interest uh, uh, technology law clinic. CIRA, the top level domain registry. And Canary, which is the uh, um, uh, academic network group in, 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 um, in Canada. And they set out they, they asked themselves the question, what can we develop? What sort of recommendations can we give industry, the other stakeholders that are responsible for implementing pieces of IoT security or making a difference with IoT security? What kind of recommendations can we give and what can we do ourselves to make that happen? What was done was a process was set up. 
by, uh, by these entities, which was open and inclusive. Um, it was a set of 20 um, uh, workshops, physical meetings across Canada. Uh, Canada is a huge country, uh, east, west, also with two different languages, Anglophone and Francophone. So it was carefully uh, uh, designed to meet in all those places and have a, a careful uh, 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 implementation uh, uh, in international, uh, intercessional work on mailing lists and so on and so forth. So the use of tools here is important. Um, all the work was tracked on a website, iotsecurity2018.ca, and you can see all the meetings, all the papers that were uh, presented there and, and discussed. Um, first thing that the, that the community did was to come together in a workshop to discuss among each other what the rules of engagement were. Simple things like, let's say, let's don't say no but, but yes and. And the group made that contract with itself and worked according to that contract uh, uh, in, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its work. Um, there were a couple of learnings and a long report, 44 pages, um, with recommendations across different stakeholder groups, consumer uh, uh, authorities, but also technical arena. And there is actual follow-up of this work in the different st stakeholder groups. And I see you're a little bit impatient, so... Keep no, and I think, just like Kenneth, you've touched on an, another really good point that I think challenges a lot of us in the multidisciplinary policy-making space. You talked about bottom-up. You talked about wide consultations, meetings, and lots of papers. My question is, how do we ensure that those large, complex processes across geographies, east, west, north, south, across stakeholders, get to the decision makers? In many cases, there's a diffusion of ideas, and it doesn't seem to always get up to the top in a succinct way. How do we ensure that? So, so in this particular case, the Ministry of Canada, the uh, responsible ministry, was involved. Um, but. This didn't happen in isolation. A similar process has been going on in France. A similar process is going on in Senegal. Uh, in the Netherlands, work was done with uh, public consultation on IoT. And um, not coincidentally, there is now an IoT platform for these countries where they meet and exchange their experiences. Um, that is, uh, you know, the same as we do here. We come together with our ideas. We are norm entrepreneurs as, uh, as uh, one of like the... That, that's good, norm entrepreneurs. That's norm, norm entrepreneurs. And this is the regime in which we form and storm and share and the networks get crossed and the ideas... That's, that's terrific. So we, in, we engage the decision makers, the structures of the decision makers early in the process, which may shed some light on, on, on paths for the IGF moving forward, greater integration of decision makers in the processes and the norm entrepreneurship that happens here every, every year. Thank you, Olaf. I'm going to pass to Lisa Dyer now, please. Lisa. Sure. Thank you for having me. For many who don't know, the Partnership on AI is a nonprofit organization with about 100 partners. 60 of our partners are civil society and nonprofit organizations, and the other 40 are evenly split between uh, industry partners, including Facebook, as well as academic and research institutions. Our work is primarily done through the multi-stakeholder process. We bring partners together to address issues that range across the spectrum. And when I say range across the spectrum, I say that because artificial intelligence has a set of technologies that are still appropriately in the research stage. They're, the academic institutions are really digging into it. It also has a set of technologies that are out on the market, and some of those technologies may have been rushed to the market. So um, we are trying to address AI in all of its different stages, in all of its different areas. And that results in different types of convenings that we pull together. We are, for instance, working on something about responsible publication norms. For the academic community, there's been this purely very focused open research 
Bill Gates, in fact, just talked about the importance that open technology is what's going to succeed. But there are some that are really concerned about the work that artificial intelligence will bring forth in the research stage, and how do we responsibly publish that information. We also talk about things like media and misinformation, which is here now, and we say trying to save democracy in the process of our work. Um, but we're doing that with a range of stakeholders, inclu including news information and our industry partners um, and others that are thinking about this very, very deeply in the academic stages. And then we also attack issues that are actually very politically contentious, emotionally contentious, and get you in the gut like facial recognition technologies. So to do this, we think very carefully about how we design our multi-stakeholder multi processes. We think about who's in the room, the agenda design, how do you build trust, how do you convince people to come forward with humility, to be willing to agree in a room where they've made mistakes or where they could have thought through a decision differently, and to have people listen and not condemn, but say, understand why you came to that decision in the first place, and let's try to find novel approaches to coming up with answers to these questions. Um, I say novel approaches because there's been a lot of very thoughtful and interesting work done on artificial intelligence, whether at a specific application level or in an actual um, theoretical sense or in a governance sense. And so we want to bring something new to the forefront um, and, and try to then work on implementation. More and more reports that sit on a table somewhere are great, but how do you then actually take it to the implementation level? And that's where we work through our various partners who also have incredible contacts and, um, and conversations with policymakers to try to talk to them about what we've come up with, why it's novel, and why we think it's important for people to listen. So I'll stop there. No, that's, that's terrific, and I very much appreciate it. I know many of the UN bodies are, are members of, of, of PAI, and so it's a terrific initiative. My question is, goes back to one of your very first points, which is bringing together stakeholders uh, with different motivations. You have stakeholders that are humanitarian, uh, you have stakeholders that are for-profit entities. How is it that you can reconcile, right from the get-go, or maybe it takes longer. You talked about the need to build trust. I want to dig in a bit deeper and say, how do you do that? How does Partners for AI go about building trust amongst the stakeholders that have different motivations? That's a great question. Um, what I've seen work successfully is um, to set ground rules for how the how the conversations are going to take place. I think when we have modified Chatham House rules kinds of conversations, uh, when we talk about uh, that we are going to treat this very carefully, when we intervene when things start getting contentious, um, those sorts of activities that show that we're here to move the conversation forward and not dig into each other, I think are very important uh, lessons that we've learned along the way. Sometimes it comes down as well to the shape of the room. We had a convening just a few weeks ago where we were in this incredible space in New York City where we had a table that was in a circle so that everybody could take a look at each other. It's different than the classroom style, it's different than a rectangular shaped table, but that gave people a chance to actually look at each other, learn, listen, and actively listen to each other. Something is just as small and as simple as that. But one of the questions that I, I wanted to turn back to you with, David, in, and one that I think is really outstanding in my mind, you opened with this conversation about the importance of time, that technology is moving at a speed in different ways that we didn't have in the atomic age or in the space age. Um, when we do these types of multi-stakeholder convenings, they take time. They take time to let people have their, their ability to contribute, to design, to, to synthesize, and to pull together, and to come up with solutions. How do you reconcile that speed of innovation and the need to act with the need to appropriately so include the many voices that are out there that, that deserve to be heard and need to be heard to make thoughtful, informed uh, recommendations to policymakers. 
putting a question back to the moderator. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Mixing um, it up a bit. <laughs> it's a lot easier to be throwing them that way than to be receiving them. Uh, I, I think I'll come back with um, one personality trait that I think we absolutely need to inherit from the previous generation, and that is humility. When the diplomats and experts sat at the table to negotiate nuclear arms agreements, the Outer Space Treaty, they were diplomats. They weren't astronauts or physicists. What they did was they were policymakers that went and talked to the expert communities, solicited their ideas, came back to the table well-read, very thoughtful, and gave very serious and enlightened opinions. And I sometimes wonder if we struggle a bit with that. People walk into a table or walk up to a negotiating space or walk into a meeting at the Partnership for AI without really having investigated the details behind it. So I think if we can inherit, and this is when we see, whether it's at the Security Council or whether it's in uh, peacekeeping missions in Eastern in Congo, when we see that there is humility at the table, I think things go much better. And so I think that's something we need to inherit uh, and bring down from previous generations. But thank you for that curveball. Um, Zoe. Thanks. I'll actually respond to your response. Um, I have some notes, but I think I'm going to wing it. Uh, I appreciate you referring to the golden age of diplomacy, but I'll also remind that the golden age of diplomacy, everyone in, at Bretton Woods was old and white and male, and so I think it's time to change the way that we do consultations. Um, so I'll just pause there for a moment and, and, and say that. But what I'm actually here to talk about is uh, the Facebook Oversight Board. And so how many of you here have heard of the Facebook Oversight Board in some fashion? Okay. So quite a few people. Um, so I won't go over the basics, the very basics. Generally, the Facebook Oversight Board is going to have two functions. One function is it's going to review our content decisions and overturn them or uphold them. Those decisions will be binding. And no one at Facebook, not me, not Mark Zuckerberg, no one will be able to overrule the board's decisions in that regard. The second thing that the board will be able to do is uh, issue policy recommendations back to us. And this is really what we've been talking about today, multi-stakeholder approaches to policy decisions. So the board, in reviewing these cases, will be able to say to us, Facebook, you need to make an adjustment, you need to make a change, you need to make a wholesale overhaul of your policies, our policies that govern 2.7 billion people. And they will issue those recommendations publicly. We will also have to make a public response. Um, so those are, that's really what the Facebook oversight is supposed to do. But what I really should talk to you is the process of how we've gotten here, because it's been a journey. It's taken over a year at this point. I'm looking at a lot of familiar faces uh, from that consultation period. Um, and when I took this job at Facebook, they said, Zoe, you worked at the UN, you have a lot of experience probably consulting uh, governments, consulting civil society, consulting a range of stakeholders. Will you, uh, will you run our global consultation process? And I said to my boss at the time, I said, yes, I have worked on a lot of consultations. And um, with all due respect in the international community, a lot of times what you do is you have backroom negotiations and a document that you know isn't going to change, um, but you marshal all of the political will outside of the room, and then you get into the room and you hold a consultation for show. And I said, if that's what you want us to do, then I'm not going to sign up for that. Uh, and so our consultation was anything from a fait accompli. Uh, we came with a draft charter that said, basically, this is our plan. We know we don't have all the answers. And so we've made a lot of changes based on what Bertrand has told us and what Maria Paz has told us and what Arsène has told us. And what those people around the room generally said was, if this doesn't have lasting influence over your policies, Facebook, then why invest the time, money, and resource into doing it? And so originally, the board really only had that one function, the content decision function overruling us on individual cases. And due to that feedback, we actually uh, changed, made a radical change, and added in the policy influence piece as the second major function of the oversight board. Another key thing uh, was that everyone around the world said, Facebook, how can this board truly be independent? If you're paying 
If you're picking the first group of members, uh, this is nothing but a PR stunt. It's for show, and, and, and it will always be tainted by uh, Facebook's influence. Fair point, we said. So A, we established an independent trust. The board uh, will be funded by, uh, by us, but we will make a multi-year commitment and a revocable grant of money to the trust. Um, and that trust will house an LLC that will hold the employment relationship with board members and their staff, none of whom will be Facebook employees. Um, the second thing we did was uh, we took back the feedback to say, okay, Facebook, you really shouldn't choose the first group of members. Fair point. Now we're choosing three co-chairs. Those co-chairs are choosing up to 20 members together with us. After that, we take a step back and the board itself will choose, uh, will, will, will take uh, the, the hand in choosing members, going up to 40 and then um, refilling the board as vacancies arrive. So those are some concrete examples of how we actually consulted and actually took on feedback, but I'm happy to, um, to, to take any more questions on the board or on our consultation process. No, that's, that's terribly helpful, thank you. And it seems like it's a very multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary approach. Um, one of the things that we often see happen is you can, you can set up the best processes in place, and this applies not just to Facebook, but across the board, private industry and governments. You can set the right policies, you can have the right communities engage and give feedback and give recommendations. And I guess the challenge that we have ultimately is if there is recommendations made and those recommendations aren't followed, uh, the, the final element of that is, is consequences. And I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, is with regards to the oversight board, which, which sounds like you're very advanced in, in working on, so, so congratulations on that. How do you ensure that there are consequences if the recommendations of the board aren't taken on or if afterwards they're discovered um, to have been different from how they were implemented? So I'll say again, there are two things. So one, we'll have seven days to implement the board's decision on content decisions. Those are binding, and so we will do that, and then we will be very public about how we implemented that. On the policy advisory statements that the board will, um, that the board will issue, those are advisory in nature. In nature, they are, are not binding. And so people have asked us this question, isn't the board really just going to be toothless if you aren't held to it? Um, I will say this is where civil society comes in and this is where public accountability comes in. Those recommendations from the board will be public. It will be highly noticeable if we make a habit and practice of not implementing those recommendations. So what the plan is for us is to take those recommendations back, consider them, um, see if they're technically feasible, see if they're operationally feasible, make sure that they don't have unintended consequences. And then we will put that policy recommendation through our uh, policy development process, which may include, for example, our po product policy forum, the minutes of which are public. And then we'll also release a, a, a public explanation of how we've taken action on those policy recommendations. So really the hook here is public accountability. Well, it's a, it's a 2.7 billion, billion person constituency, so they, they will be keeping a close eye, and I think being transparent is a great way to, to lead down that road. Thank you to our second panel uh, for your incredible consultations. We are now going to move to a Q&A period. Um, we're going to be looking at questions from the floor. I've got about, I could probably take three questions from the floor. Um, a bit of diversity here in the question askers. Um, especially if we have a bit of gender diversity in the question askers. Um, no, you don't need to put your hands down. I think that's good that they're up, but um, okay, we'll start here in the front. Um, hello, I'm a MA researcher from Brazil, and my name is Fernando, and my question goes in the sense to question how uh, in the last few years, refugees, migrants, and a lot of the minority groups have been articulating politically throughout social media platforms. And having such impact on international community and their national communities. One such example is on the DDRC with a political group that it's organized throughout WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, my question goes uh, both for Mr. Safadi and Mr. and Ms. Zoe uh, Darm. <laughs> uh, 
so how can Facebook and national governments work together to regulate these kinds of political groups since uh, there's a lot of controversy in my country on how uh, you can organize a party digitally and well, uh, it's a really big challenge from both the public sector and social media platforms, I, I imagine. Thank, thank you. That's, that's terribly smart. We're going to take uh, two more. The gentleman there, yeah? The microphone should be on. My name is Sabe Loam Shambi. I'm a researcher at the Carr Center for Human Rights and the Berkman Klein Center, both at Harvard University. Um, I have a fear, and maybe it's unfounded, but I worry that the term multi-stakeholder is overly used. It presents an illusion of progress, an illusion of community, and uh, fails to really address the core issue, which is the power asymmetries that exist between the stakeholders and the different competing interests. So how do we deal with those power asymmetries? And uh, as a follow-up, uh, I can point to uh, the Facebook example. Um, uh, the panelists mentioned that we still have public accountability which will give teeth uh, to the recommendation board. But I worry that uh, many users of Facebook, for example, are, are in the African continent, but they lack the economic and political power to signal their interests. And so how can they, how are the platforms truly, uh, how will they be responsive to the public? Thank you, thank you. We're gonna take a final question here. Yes, the gentleman with his hand up there. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Armin Rabic, I'm presenting Election Watch EU. I have actually two, uh, two questions uh, regarding, one, the possible monopolization or like, so, or like, oligopoly about uh, political campaign and political advertisement through social media. Uh, in the 2020 US election next year, it's foreseen that probably 50% of the campaign spending in the media is done through the social media space. And we know about the way this money might be spent. The other issue is the question of transparency. While it's but transparency is good in many areas. Uh, transparency in the elections might not be that good if you know how uh, a user or a consumer of social media is voting. So my question to the panel is how to ensure that social media companies or platforms are not uh, already aware what's the result of an election before an election day. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Marie Paz, I'm going to come to you for, um, do we have anybody online that's dialing in with a, with a question, please? Yeah. Uh, I am Maria Paz Canales, the uh, remote moderator. I'm going to do to the panel a question from Jean-Philippe Rouvain. Um, he will be interested in knowing the multidisciplinary perspective of the panel regarding the issue of the internet addiction disorder. And if you're not familiar with the content, he provided a description with this is a, a, a syndrome that includes changing mood, preoccupation with the internet and the digital media, and the inability to control the amount of time spent interfacing with digital technology. So in general, that's the description. I think that it's clear, and from a multidisciplinary perspective, how do you think that the different uh, work that you engage with, uh, with technology and, and policy could deal with this kind of aspect that are more health issues than the usual uh, policy governance that we, we touch on? Thank you. Thank you, Marie Pans, for bringing that in. Okay. I'm sorry to interject, but it would be really helpful if in main sessions people who ask questions ask questions that are directly related to the topic of the, of the panel. Thank you for that intervention. Um, we're going to start, we've had questions on regulators of elections, we've had questions on power asymmetries in multi-stakeholder processes, we've had questions on uh, oligopolies and monopolies and their impact on elections, and internet addiction. 
multidisciplinary engagement. Um, Zoe, we're going to start with you as a couple of the questions were directed your way, and then we'll come down. We're going to have about two or three minutes per panelist, uh, if, that's, if that's all right. Thank yeah, you. I, I, uh, thank you, Bertrand. I probably won't answer all of the questions because some of them aren't quite related to what I do, um, but I will take as many as possible that um, relate specifically to the oversight board or are tangential to it. So first on, uh, on elections, one thing I do want to really clarify in addition to our um, ads transparency work, the oversight board will have advertisements within its remit. Uh, so, it, so we are working to build uh, uh, the tools that will allow ads to be appealed up to the board. So it may not be immediately available uh, on January 2020, but it's something that we are working hard uh, and uh, have fully envisioned in the board's uh, governing documents to include as part of its scope. The second thing that I will address is how can Facebook and national governments work together? Um, uh, so I, I've worked with the Congolese government before in my previous capacity um, and, and know how important it is that, that governments and civil society and business uh, all have a seat at the table. I will say for the oversight board, um, we actually are not going to have government officials on the board. We heard that this was a really uh, uh, key part of the board's um, independence and legitimacy <laughs> and its ability to make uh, decisions independent of, um, of Facebook, independent of other third parties who might want to influence the board's decision. So, so I will say that it's sort of a non-answer. Sorry. Um, and then on power asymmetries and specifically the African continent, one thing I'd really like to talk to you afterwards about is um, we know that not all regions avail themselves of formal, uh, formal uh, mechanisms like appeals equally. Uh, in some countries, that's fairly natural to do. Yes, I want to appeal this decision. I don't mind submitting uh, my case. In some countries, people feel less comfortable doing that. They feel somehow that it might get reported to the government. It might get reported um, elsewhere, that their privacy may not be protected, even though that's not the case and that's not what we're building with the Oversight Board. We know that that sentiment um, is there and it, it reduces the access uh, equal access um, across all regions. And so that's something we're really thinking about. Um, we're also thinking about ways that users, when they submit their requests to the board, maybe in the future we don't just require written submissions, but maybe they can uh, give their side of the story orally um, or through a voice recording, et cetera. Um, again, that's not something that we're, we may have available exactly on January 2020, but it's something that we're thinking through really carefully. And that picks up on a couple of themes from the panel discussion. Transparency and using new tools to increase that transparency that might not address power asymmetries, but it can be a start towards that process. And so yeah, we really encourage increased transparency and, and follow on that way. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. Lisa. I thought I'd also try to address the question about power asymmetries and using multi-stakeholder processes as illusions of progress. I actually do think that the multi-stakeholder process that we are running is an indication of progress. We are focused on bringing in partners who are experiential experts. They are not artificial intelligence experts, but they come from backgrounds that should inform the future development of technology. And like Zoe, I have seen those backroom conversations and the illusion that diplomacy was a, a consultative process, but in fact it was made by just a few very special people absolutely would not want to belong to an organization that does that kind of work now, and I can tell you that we do not at PAI. We bring in people from uh, unions, which in a European setting, they may, that may sound surprising, but in the United States, the unions aren't quite as strong as they used to be. We bring in people who are formerly incarcerated to comment on our work. We bring in people who do not have driver's licenses, as we're thinking about autonomous vehicles. We bring in people who um, have experiences that we just do not replicate within Silicon Valley or within um, the highly technical community that we work with. So to me, that is absolutely a sign of progress. 
On the power asymmetry side of it, we recognize the power that many of these industry organizations hold, and our theory of change rotates around those people who hold the, that power. Our theory of change is that the multi-stakeholder work that we do informs the decisions that these heads of AI research, heads of engineering, or product managers within companies take, the decisions they make in developing the technology, building the technology, as well as operating the technology. And that they will accept with humility the information that's coming from people from across different parts of society, from across the world, um, in making those decisions. So. Thank you. That makes complete sense with what everyone else is saying on the panel. That sounds like a great initiative. Thanks, Lisa. Olaf. I think uh, to, to fill on, the, uh, on that, uh, the power asymmetries always exist. Somebody has the bag with money, somebody does the work, uh, somebody has the information, et cetera, et cetera. So if you really commit to a multi-stakeholder or a multidisciplinary uh, process, you have to be transparent about the power you hold and your intention to do with the input in regard to your power. Um, as far as multidisciplinary uh, processes go, I think the question about uh, perspective on uh, addictive disorder uh, is a good thing. I have no qualities and understanding of that, so I'm not going to answer that question. And I think that's very important. However, you said something during the introduction about spectrum. People who don't know anything about spectrum should not be in the discussion when you talk about spectrum. However, in another part of the internet society, we work on community networks. And the availability of spectrum is very important to make sure that the underserved also get access to internet. And so there's always, the, I think the, 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 the responsibility is also to make sure to rise the discussion to the appropriate level of uh, the policy question that is being answered and then say, what is the role of the specialist here? The specialist will, you know, do the spectral density analysis and what have you, um, but it, it is in the end, what is the requirement from the public policy perspective and what are the stakeholders in that process that need to be involved? And I think that is the joint responsibility that you have in these multidisciplinary processes to make sure that you get the right input from the right specialist at the right time with the right purpose. Yeah, digging down into those silos and making sure that all the silos are accounted for, that makes complete sense. Thanks a lot. Kenneth. Uh, yes, thank you. So. Um, let me just, so with the uh, spectrum example that I gave, uh, so what I think is that um, in the multi-stakeholder process in identifying uh, representatives from each stakeholder group, the group is the group's responsibility to make sure that the representative that they nominate to represent them on the committee has to have the expertise or background. And, and the experience that we, we had and what we have done based on challenges that we have faced is that when we have to build um, a, a multi-stakeholder approach in any of the, we try to train the people, do some capacity, do so at least some basic awareness creation and capacity just to build their confidence to be able to participate. We don't just call them and say, hey, come. So, so that's one of the processes that, that we do. So I think with the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, overly power thing, if the constitution at the, uh, at the stakeholder level is kind of balanced, I think you know, the power, the kind of power can, can reduce. For instance, if you have a high level advisory committee or, or steering committee, and you can have, let's say, the minister from the government being the chairman, you could have um, a, a co-chair from the civil society or from the private sector. I mean, I've seen that work and, and it's, it's been so if the minister is the minister doesn't have all the power to make that decisions and all that so um, if we can have a right balance in every phase of the policy framework uh, right from design implementation monitoring I think we'll be able to go that thanks I think that's the right balance that we're seeking absolutely Safari uh, the guy speak about uh, the situation in DRC I think I had I have uh, I had many occasions to speak about it during other year forum on internet, your freedom and what. 
uh, I cannot come back on that one, but uh, what I can say in short, you, if you see the social political situation of some country as a DRC or other country, it will be very difficult to, to say 100% there will never again be internet shutdown. It's, it's quite impossible because we there is some local reality that make, you know, internet is like an amplifier. It can amplify good things, but it can also amplify bad things. So when it amplifies bad things, it can impact life of many millions of people. And we have been speaking about uh, uh, Facebook uh, using it at artificial intelligence, how to, they can uh, uh, see to moderate the, the head speech and what and what. Those kind of things is like a, a, a smooth shutdown because you are putting down those bad things that came out from in internet. But our country don't have those kind of capability to regulate. And when you don't have, you found that you have the only chance just to shut down, but I think we'll not have that. Uh, we'll not have to go on that uh, up to that level if we have the capability and really raise what concern we have. Really, that having that, uh, uh, leaving it uh, open like that can affect the right of other people. We had a, a election in our country. But I can tell you really, if we, if internet was there on that time, maybe we not have that uh, the the election will not end like it ends in peace like that. There may be several war because, as I say, internet is an amplifier. And during the election, there is so much passion and tension. If we, if we, it cannot, if it, we are not able to manage it, it can end up on. Uh, on a bad side. You are not on the level of uh, free democracy and understanding. Uh, even our, in our people, we still have those things of uh, a tribe and things like that. And that way, uh, maybe Facebook can help us to manage it and avoid avoid to fall in censorship and also avoid to go in a, in a, in a, in a the shutdown. But my concern was uh, on the on the, when we speak about multi stakeholder, on that point of shutdown, when there was a, 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 one of the people in the civil society who was dealing with a complaint from uh, shutdown during that time, I was thinking that the one who will come to complain will be the telecom because they are losing money or the mobile financial services because also they are losing money. But the first one who came to complain it was those people with disability. Because those ones, they was not losing money. They was just losing life. They was just losing life. They cannot communicate. They cannot exchange with the people. They was like they are out of the, the, the society because of lack of internet. And that show the necessity to have a multi-stakeholder when you are thinking about anything about internet. The policy and other things we have to have that one because internet impacts everyone even if those one that you don't think they are using internet maybe they are using it more not often than you but more useful than us we use and that touches on the necessity to understand the context there is no longer a digital and an analog world it is a digital world you know if maybe someone doesn't have a smartphone but the road that their bus takes or the time that it arrives is connected to uh, a main server and that requires the internet. Really important contribution. Thank you, Safari. Shital. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief um, because I know we're running out of time um, and it would be great to hear from the audience again. Um, so we've heard so many of the challenges and someone called them existential earlier, whether they're internet addiction or AI or election interference. Um, and I think that the multidisciplinary approach is going to be absolutely essential to dealing with those. So contrary to them kind of being irrelevant, I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're some of examples of the issues that we have to deal with in an inclusive way. Of course, when, um, when, whenever we talk about the multi-stakeholder approach, there's always rightfully, I think, a concern raised that the approach is used as a smokescreen to legitimize particular int stakeholder interests over others. Um, and that's something I think a lot of civil society groups are particularly sensitive to. And building trust in a multi-stakeholder process is 
as I said earlier, really um, determined by how much transparency there is. And we, we heard about some good examples, I think, about contracts for engagement, listening to concerns, and then incorporating those concerns as with the Facebook Oversight Board, um, coming up with um, uh, technical solutions for some of the concerns. And then I think also a commitment to ongoing listening is absolutely essential. Um, so that transparency piece is really, really important. Um, and yes, and I think, you know, I don't know if we're going to have time for a closing, um, but I, I would say that my, my understanding of the challenges at hand are, are that the solutions will be not only technical or the technical solutions where and when they are appropriate will come from conversations like this. The internet of tomorrow, the digital age of tomorrow is our collective project and we all have a responsibility for that and I think really listening, really taking into consideration the challenges and the um, the lessons learned from implementing multi-stakeholder processes um, is, is going to be essential. It's not perfect. There's no perfect multi-stakeholder approach, but there are certain key principles that we have that guide us. Um, and as long as we're committed to learning um, and improving those, improving our um, implementation of those, I think we'll be in, in a good way. Governance of the internet, the IGF. This is, for a lot of people, increasingly an existential issue. Picks up on what Safari was saying. Completely agree. Sophie. Thank you. Um, so why does the International Chamber of Commerce in, get involved in a multi-stakeholder approach? Because frankly, it makes sense. It's a good investment. If we don't get the right stakeholders around the table, we're going to have to start all over again, uh, lose a lot of time. And back to Lisa's curveball, which I also like very much, I don't think that it's, uh, I agree with you, I don't think it's, it's a waste of time. I think, I don't see a dichotomy between this relatively long and um, time consuming uh, exercise. Uh, I think it's a good investment and, and I think, you know, it's, it's absolutely worth uh, uh, doing that. Uh, to Kenneth's point, yes, I think there's a huge capacity building uh, question that, that needs to be put on the table, but for all of the stakeholders uh, around the table, I don't think that we can just point the finger and say, well, actually, you don't have the skills because when we, you get involved in a multi-stakeholder approach, you realize just w the types of skills that you need and, and how you need to get involved in that and, and, the, and the requirements. And actually, you can, I think, speaking for myself anyway, I've picked up a lot of skills along the way, and I think that's true of, of a lot of people. Are there power asymmetries? Yes, but I think that they are evolving also in the multi-stakeholder approach. You can realize that an expert around the table may not be the person who you thought was going to be the pivotal person who was going to make that multi-stakeholder process uh, come to a, a fruitful conclusion. Um, and uh, just um, wanting to echo the fact that yes, we also work with governments, we work with civil society, we work with everyone. So, um, and, and this is my full first IGF. And I'm happy to be here, but I have to say okay. that I've learned a lot along, along this uh, past week. Um, I'm, I'm amazed by the commitment, the long-term commitment of many people in the room, the very diverse um, profiles that are here, and, and I think it's, it's a very uh, worthwhile investment as well to come here and to, to come to grips with the different issues that are uh, evolving. Uh, Olaf, you mentioned uh, we'll, IoT was the big topic a few years ago, now it's AI. Uh, so I think this is a, a really good laboratory in order to, to make sure that we are um, involved in the right processes, that we have the right people around the table. So, so thank you for inviting me and, and taking part in this panel as well. Thank you, Sophie. And you touched on passion and, and the commitments earlier and the fact that a lot of the people here are so invested over a long period of time. Who here was involved in the WISIS conversations? Do we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, over a dozen people in this, in this? It's been a long time. Thank you for your long term commitment to this process, uh, Molly. So just a couple words about the power asymmetries. I mean, what we were talking about is a couple people kind of colluding behind back doors. And one thing we do at the OECD, the going digital work is undertaken by 20 different committees. And in each different committee, you have different stakeholders on the committee that come from their individual silos that have their own perspectives. And so you can't really do that uh, in our context. On the money side, which isn't trivially, trivial for civil society organizations, we do try to support civil society to come to the meetings to get their input. We actually view that as really, really uh, important. I appreciated the online uh, question about 
uh, internet addiction disorder, we started to look at some of the health impacts of the internet in our publication. Cyberbullying is something that we're also worried about, but then there's the flip side to that and all the benefits that telemedicine can bring to those in rural areas, uh, to people who wouldn't be able to get medical advice if you didn't have it. And something I haven't heard a lot about at this IGF is the impact of digital transformation on overall well-being. And it's really hard because you have both sides. You have the risks, you have the benefits. How do you balance them? It's something we started looking at in the first phase of the project from a measurement perspective, but you had to have a dichotomy, risk or benefit. And something that we really want to look at going forward, and I think other people should too, is trying to suss out uh, what the de delicate balance is because well-being, I think we can all agree, is the ultimate objective. Thanks very much for... Yeah, thanks, Molly. That's terrific. I love, I love the idea of balance. So we have about one minute remaining, and I want to thank everybody, first of all, for the terrific contributions that you've made. Maybe taking away some of the lessons learned here. Um, policy making in a multidisciplinary framework will succeed if it is inclusive rather than exclusive. That it has co-chairs that work together, to Kenneth's point. Um, that it's transparent, to pick up on what Zoe was talking about. The idea that you can use new tools, 21st century tools, uh, to be more transparent is only going to improve your process and increase the trust um, that, Shell, you were talking about. Processes that are inclusive, multi-stakeholder, transparent, and use modern tools can lead to, as you said, Molly, balanced outcomes, better informed decisions, uh, and, and more aware and informed outcomes. So um, a lot certainly to take away from this panel. I want to thank everybody for coming and joining this afternoon, and thanks again to the panelists. Thank you.